thank you, sir. Let's see here. Uh, I can interrupt, by the way, before I begin this presentation, I wanted to say thanks to Fred Cagle uh, for sending out that uh, group's IO email recently uh, that had the link to the presentation that I gave eight years ago, uh, where I made some predictions about what might happen. And of course, lots of those things did happen, but some didn't. So today we're going to talk about trends in personal technology. Um, as I mentioned before, eight years ago, I changed the name of the presentation from trends in personal computing to trends in personal technology, because after all, computing is everywhere. So let us begin. So tonight we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. First, a little bit about artificial intelligence. Then we're going to talk about matter. And no, I don't mean dirt in the ground. Uh, then uh, a little bit about electric vehicles. And finally, it's all about bandwidth. Of course, it's been about bandwidth for the last many, many years. So let's begin. First, let's talk about artificial intelligence. Um, there's been a lot of chatter lately about artificial intelligence and the outfit behind a lot of what's going on right now is called OpenAI. They're a research laboratory that has engineers and researchers who look at advancing developments in artificial intelligence technologies. They've been around since 2015 and have founding members uh, that include many industry leaders that you recognize on this list. Uh, their goal is to develop and promote friendly artificial intelligence for the betterment of all humanity. It sounds like a typical goal. And to take steps to ensure that research benefits society as a whole. Now, in terms of breakthroughs, they've had many advances in natural language processing, uh, reinforcement learning, computer vision, things like that. And they've released tools and frameworks so people could do some development. One of them is called OpenAI Gym to develop and compare uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. They're focused on promoting public awareness and understanding of AI technologies. They put out papers, reports, educational resources, all aimed at telling the public more about what the AI opportunities are and the challenges associated with it. Uh, funding for this operation comes from a couple different places, many prominent technology investors, uh, partnerships with corporations. Uh, one that was mentioned way back when was Microsoft, which invested at the time $1 billion in the organization. And over time, their investment has creased, increased. I believe the most recent number I saw was $10 billion. So Microsoft has a lot of stake in this. <clears throat> now, a very key date here in terms of artificial intelligence was November 30th, 2022, because in that date, chat GPT was announced, okay? Now, the question is, what's chat GPT? Well, if you ask chat GPT what it is, it will tell you that it's a large open AI language model that generates lots of human-like responses to natural language questions or inputs based on deep learning architectures trained on massive amounts of text data, learning patterns, relationships between words, phrases, in a natural language format. And it understands the context of a conversation. And it's been used in a variety of applications, chatbots, language translation, text generation, things like that. I also asked chatbot, how do you explain chatbot to a non-technical person, like your mother, maybe, or your grandmother? And chatbot told me that it's a computer program that talks with people in a natural and human-like way, it uses advanced artificial intelligence technology to understand what people were saying and uh, uh, reply appropriately. Use a large database of text from the internet to learn how people typically communicate, and it contains millions of examples on the ways people use language in books, articles, 
and social media posts. Also, it analyzes data to learn how to understand the meaning behind what's being said and how to use that understanding to have conversa meaningful conversations with people. And of course, this can be a customer service chatbot, a personal assistant. It can have help with tasks like answering questions, providing information, or just having a friendly chat with you. So in short, chatbot says that it's a computer program that can talk with people like a human using the power of artificial intelligence. Now, let's talk about experiences. So since chatbot has been out since November 30th, what's been happening? Well, first of all, I found out that CNET is quietly publishing entire, uh, CNET's been quietly publishing articles uh, generated by AI. Um, it is interesting to note that people have been keeping track of errors that they have found in chatbot. Uh, there's a link in my notes to this Google Documents that uh, people go in. And as of when I checked it earlier today, number 240, which was logged earlier today at 205, I suspect that's uh, GMT. Chatbot, chatbot does not understand that you cannot move one end of a string by pushing on the other end. So all kinds of interesting errors are being logged in this chatbot document. Uh, the other interesting thing about chatbot is it apparently passed a Google coding interview for a level three engineer with $183,000 a year salary. Uh, Google unveiled their version of an AI called Bard, its answer to chatbot. However, it answered incorrectly and it saw its stock value drop, uh, we think because of that. And China got in there too uh, with their rival. However, it crashed a few hours after launching because they didn't expect as much traffic as it got. Also, my <laughs> this is another interesting one, Microsoft chatbot, uh, on uh, February 16th, the headline was, it's going off the rails, it's doing all kinds of crazy. Um, so what Microsoft did because of this, they limited their Bing AI chat to five replies in any one session and 50 replies over any one day. That was on uh, February 18th. However, on February 21st, they upped it to six chats per session and 60 per day. Now, the other interesting thing about chat GPT experiences is I have seen several uh, BCUG member group IO messages concerning chatbot and its uses and their experiences with it, okay? So that's chatbot and GPT. So now let's talk about this thing called matter. And no, I don't mean matter as in dirt in the ground. What Bill, I'm yes. Bill, Fred, Fred here. Can I go back to the chat uh, for, sure. for one moment? Sure. Chat GBT, is it, it's built upon open AI. Is that my understanding? Yeah, open, open AI, my understanding is the organization that built it, yes. Okay, so what does Microsoft add to OpenAI to make it theirs? Um, well, let's see, they, they give them money. And <laughs> if I remember one of the articles I read recently talked about um, they have their own secret sauce that they might add in to it to make it different in some way. I'm not sure exactly what that is. Okay. Because I I've played with OpenAI, and I haven't seen any of this, uh, you know, not answering correctly or nefarious responses. Well, I mean, have you gone on for 15 hours trying to talk to it? Like no. The reporters have? No, because what happens when you ask a question or you start a conversation, yeah. it, it comes back literally with a page full of responses. It, it, it's so much information that I don't even know what my second question is going to be because it answered it in the first question. Oh, well, I, and the other thing I found, and you'll see this in the notes, um, there are people who have, I'll call them programming sequences to get chat, I, chat GPT 
or, or Bing AI to do various things. So people are out there testing the limits of this thing. Okay. So, and, and yes, if it gives you a page full of data, not necessarily information, but data, sure, it's going to, you know, you, you sometimes might forget what your next question is going to be. Okay. To be, to be continued and discussed on the... Uh, on uh, the of Google. course. That, that, that's why I had that last item in there. For yeah, 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 because... You know, <laughs> it's like everybody's talking about it. And when Absolutely. When John Absolutely. Stanford, I talked I, about this uh, a couple uh, of weeks ago. Uh, I said, well, this has got to be one of the things I talk about in the presentation. Hot topic. Hey, Please. you got that right. I don't think there's a hotter topic on the planet right now. Right. Anyway, continuing on... Let's talk about matter. Matter was something that I mentioned last year that was just starting to peak above the, the waterline, but it's now progressed a lot farther. What is matter? Well, it's an interoperability standard designed to solve many of today's smart home headaches. Um, you may remember in the presentation that I gave eight years ago, thank you, Fred, um, because I did actually go back and listen to the whole thing and look back at the view graphs. I talked about ecosystems and silos and each major player had their own um, ecosystem of stuff that only they could talk to. Well, the industry has gotten a little bit smarter since then and said, hey, you know, uh, we really should talk about working with each other. And there's this connectivity standards alliance that has this industry, unprecedented industry coalition. You've got platform owners like Apple, Google, Amazon, major manufacturers like Samsung, LG. You also have smaller accessory focused players, Nanoleaf, Eve, TP Link, just to name a few. <clears throat> so this is a specification on how devices should talk to each other. And it runs over existing protocols, uh, two mechanisms for low power, low bandwidth devices like light bulb sensors. There's something called thread. And then for higher bandwidth applications, you, it will work over ethernet or Wi-Fi. okay? And the, the, another point here is that devices can be controlled locally. They don't require an internet connection to work or to work together. There is, however, cloud connectivity as an option to allow out of the home control and integration with cloud services if you want to have it. Now, let's look at these components that make up matter. First of all, there's a controller and a companion smart home platform app that allows you to bring devices on board to the home network, manage communication, control them, facilitate remote access, and uh, have a Wi Fi internet connection. That's what controllers are about. There's a thread border router that needs for threaded devices to be able to talk to the controller. And there is some existing matter controllers that also incorporate a thread border router. Another component, as we said before, are apps. And that's how you add matter, a matter device to your smart home ecosystem. And this uh, app acts as a commissioner, if you will, connecting the devices to matter controllers, and it also allows you to set up automations and routines. <clears throat> also, there's bridges that are needed for thread devices to talk to the controllers. And some, once again, with some existing controllers have these thread border routers. Now, what's the state of the industry right now as we speak? Well, first of all, you've got light bulbs, and light switches, plugs, outlets, locks, Thermostats, other HVAC, HVAC controllers, blind shades, sensors, TV, streaming video players, bridges, uh, wireless access points. Let me talk about a few of those. So I looked into it. By the way, the, the link in the notes uh, is an article on Verge that's extremely long. And that's where this information is pulled from. Uh, for example, if you're an Apple household, and you have a second generation HomePod, or even a HomePod mini, Apple TV 4K uh, 22 version, or Apple uh, TV 4K uh, 21 version, Google Home, 
if you have a Nest Hub or a Nest Hub Max, if you have a Samsung, they have several smart things, a station and a hub, and uh, AOTech also makes a smart things, smart home hub. <clears throat> now, matter controllers without thread capability, Apple, the old version of home, HomePod and previous versions of Apple 4K um, TV, Amazon is a bunch of stuff out there, Alexa and Echo line of speakers and studios and shows, things like that. Google has Nest Audio, Nest Mini, Nest Hub, Google Home, and Google Home Mini. <clears throat> Samsung has their smart things, the old, the smart hub things hub too. Uh, you've also got Nebu Casa Home Assistant, Home Assistant software. Now let's take a look at what apps we got out there right now. Apple Home app on any device that runs iOS 16.1 or newer is also matter enabled. Uh, Samsung Smart Things app, Google Home app, Amazon Alexa, the Eve app. And let's take a look at where this whole thing is going. You're going to see garage door and gate controllers. You're going to have home security cameras, uh, environmental sensors and controls. Uh, smoke and CO detectors, uh, ambient motion detectors. In essence, what you're seeing is all categories of home automation equipment are starting to jump on this matter uh, bandwagon, energy management. So what do we see in terms of upcoming controllers that have thread border routers included? Amazon Alexa Echo is coming out. Uh, Samsung Smart Things has a couple things that are uh, going to be coming out in 2023. Home Pro Hub, Hoobs Pro, PP Link Home Base, Tap, Tap OH 900. Uh, got some new controllers, Samsung Smart Things. There's several of these coming out. Uh, you'll notice they even have monitors in here. There's a fridge, um, smart TVs, other platforms. Um, there's brilliant smart home panel, LG Smart TVs with WebOS 22 and 23, Louie board, just a whole whole load of things. Um, and of course, the Alexa app is gonna be coming out, the uh, Aquara app, Eve app, TP-Link, uh, Tuya Smart Life app. Tuya is, a, a, you'll see this in the notes, it, it's actually a company that, that enables IoT-like devices. Uh, Wiser app, uh, bridges that are going they going to support matter. You the Philips U bridge for your Philips lights. Uh, now I mentioned a car before. They have a a several items coming out. You'll see all these things are tagged by 2023. Uh, we'll have to see how this turns out when I give the talk in 2024. Uh, Bosch, uh, IKEA, Schneider Electric. Uh, switch bot. Okay. Any questions about that? I got 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 a question. You mentioned a just very small uh, amount of time and briefly yes. IoT. What's the difference between this matter versus the Internet of Things IoT? Well, <clears throat> let's see. As I talked about eight years ago, Fred, uh, IoT is computers talking to computers. Okay, and. Yeah. When you get right down to it, all of this home automation stuff that I just breezed through, uh, they're all small computers. So they are really uh, part of the IoT bandwagon. Does that? So mat matter is a subset of IoT? Or mat matter is a protocol that will allow different types of IoT to communicate uh, um, to be controlled and potentially communicate with each other. All right. Matter is a protocol. Matter is a protocol. Yes. Matter is a protocol. Okay. okay. No, Richard, yes. Bra Richard Bradford has uh, his hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Are Richard. there any bridges or Bluetooth devices? Bridge devices? Or Bluetooth? 
uh, Bluetooth. Bluetooth communications. Um, in, in everything I've read so far, I didn't see any mention of Bluetooth. Okay, uh, because uh, be, you know they're, they they talked about all the other uh, things, but remember Bluetooth. I think primarily is to talk from something that is very local to the other thing and, and, and is done on a pairwise basis. Okay, so I didn't see any mention of Bluetooth in in all my searching. All right. Anything else on on that on that matter, quote unquote? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, if nothing else right now, let's go ahead and talk about electric vehicles, because after all, um, what's been going on in this space? Well, first of all, I mentioned this last year, and I said at the time where electric vehicles were transitioning from cutting edge to standards. And I think based on the sales volumes that happened in 2022, I believe that transition has happened. It's standard issue. I don't know about the rest of you, but I have seen uh, many, many more electric vehicles going up and down the roadways here in New Jersey than I did uh, in the past. And we've seen Ford, General Motors, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, uh, making EVs more accessible to people. They're trying to do it at lower prices. I give as a point of reference the uh, commercials during the Super Bowl this year, uh, where uh, General Motors was very big on all the upcoming 2020, uh, probably 2024 models coming out this year uh, to grab people's attention. Uh, of course, Tesla continues expanding, and, and startups like Lucid and Rivian have entered the market. Uh, I've actually seen a couple Rivian um, trucks. Um, I've not seen a Lucent yet, but they're, they're there. Uh, let's just talk about some of the basics about charging infrastructure. First of all, there's level one charging, which uses your 120 volt uh, household, or maybe uh, if you're down in Australia, uh, does Australia have 240 down there, or do you have 120, Richard? It's all 240 volts in Australia. You're 240, okay. So do they, are they talking about level one and 240 down there? Or no, or do you know? Uh, well, I think the 240 volts uh, handle higher amperage charge rates. Yeah, yeah. Because they're they're even uh, putting in devices that are three phase devices, which uh, okay. operate at 415 okay. volts. So you're, you're probably talking level two at that point, because level two talks about 208 to 240 AC volts, both level one and level two are AC. And of course, that's the second fastest uh, charging option. And you typically find these in homes um, and they're the most current uh, public type right now. And then there's level three charging, which is 400 to 900 DC volts, fastest option. And they're typically referred to as DC fast chargers and they're exclusively for public use. So let's take a look at some of these things. Uh, the uh, standard that people go by is called J1772. And this handles level one and level two charging. This is what the plug looks like on the vehicle. Okay, if we move on, there's a J772 uh, combo CCS. This is the upgraded one that handles level one, level two, and level three. In this picture, you see the little flop down door here that gives you access to the level three charging capability. And um, Tesla, of course, has their own proprietary uh, plug that takes care of level one, two, and three. Tesla will sell you adapters should you need to use a J1772 or CCS. And the other interesting thing is within the past week or two, Tesla has made the announcement that because they want money from the US federal government, they're willing to open up some of their supercharging station 
to all users. Now, <clears throat> now there is a fourth one here uh, called Chad DEMO. Uh, this is legacy. It's really being phased out. Um, it happens to be the level three charging standard in Japan, and which that means you're going to find it on some of your early EVs like the Nissan Leaf and the Mitsubishi I MIEV. Um, now, to keep track of uh, charging, uh, there's a bunch of apps out there. You've got PlugShare that allows you to find local and remote uh, road trip EV charging stations. And they've got, uh, they really feature everyone's um, charging stations, reg uh, regardless of who they are. So they've got 600,000 uh, stations across um, a cross section of different networks. You've got particular networks like ChargePoint, it's got 163,000. Uh, Electrify America, and they're focused mainly on level three DC fast chargers. You got EVGo, uh, where you can reserve a charger ahead of time. And you got Volta, and Volta is uh, uh, focuses on free EV charges. So when you go to the mall or you go to the movies, you might find the ability to to plug in and charge while you're doing whatever it is you're going to do at that location. And that would probably be a Volta, Volta network. Um, there's also Google charging ports, if you will. So you can go to here, and let me do this in real time because I love doing this. <laughs> and what you see here is uh, that particular URL goes to my location because you, you see the uh, latitude and longitude statements. And what you get on, over here on the one side is a list of stations and what the capabilities of those stations are. There's an EV charging station here um, that is right there. There's what it looks like. Um, this is the old ShopRite um, store parking lot that's on Route 35 in Middletown. And you can see here that if you have a CCS plug and your vehicle is capable of it, they can uh, max you out at 350 kilowatts. So that's pretty hefty. Um, they also have some uh, of these CH8 demo things. And there's other ones here as well. So you can, you can find them on Google Maps. Um, you could probably find them also on a Apple Maps. Uh, let's see here. Anyway, <clears throat> as far as, so what's been going on with sales, you see here that globally, uh, battery EVs and plug-in hybrid sales have been going up rather exponentially over the past few years. You see here that the battery electric vehicles themselves um, went up 71% in 2021, 73% in 2022. Uh, plug-in hybrids did pretty well too. Uh, and the market share here, 13% in uh, 2022, not bad. In terms of where these uh, vehicles are selling, you'll see a good chunk of them are in Europe. Um, and let's see here, this one, yeah, the gray ones are 2021, the blue ones are 2022. You see that China has a very big, population of electric vehicles, North America and others. Okay, any questions about electric vehicles before we go on? Well, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, without getting political. <laughs> we don't uh, political. There is, there is, <laughs> I'm not sure you can do that. Yeah, okay. but go I'm, ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna get, um, uh, I'm gonna get uh, physical. Oh, in, okay, go ahead. As in uh, physics. Yeah. There's a, law, there's a law called Law of Conservation of Energy. Yes, I've heard of that. I've heard of that too. You cannot create nor destroy energy. That's correct. Um, you're going to need batteries, and batteries need rare earth materials. There is a controversy about whether, in fact, we have sufficient rare earth materials to supply batteries. Uh, That's what, right. What's the development in, in that arena? Uh, Without getting political. 
Well, it, it's pretty easy because I don't, I don't have a whole lot of background information on that, Fred. So it's it's fairly easy for me to avoid that question. I I do know that it is a question. I don't know what the parameters of the uh, um, discussion are, shall we say, at this point. And um, you know, it, it's one of these things that I remember in grad school when in 1973. Uh, hearing the statement, you know, we're going to run out, run out of oil pretty soon. And, um, you know, who knows what uh, things might happen in the next period of time that might change the conversation. We've seen that happen before. And who knows? You know, that, that's why, that, that's all I can say. And, and, and like I said, said in my talk eight years ago, some of the things I talked about then really didn't happen. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, thank you for putting that link out there so I can go back and remind myself what I said eight years ago. And some things don't pan out the way people think they might. We know that. We've seen that happen again and again. So, but there are, there are people like you and futurists like Ray Kurzweil and others. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then there's some crazies out there that predict the future and um, things things happen and things don't happen. But that's true. And and, and alternate, you know, I, I read an article in the past couple of days about, what was it? They were focusing sunlight in a very narrow beam to uh, heat up molten materials that held heat that were then transferred to something that generated power. You know, you get stuff like that and you go, hmm, you got to wonder what's going on or, or how it's all, all going to shake out. I mean, I will be the first to admit, I have no clue. I just kind of, this talk is more about what what are people talking about? What's out there? Right. That, right? So, okay, we'll, we'll check back with you in eight years. Yeah, check back with me in eight years, will you? Well, okay. there was a big article today on... Uh, one of the sites, so I think it was even on CNBC, I, I texted a little bit about it, that electric vehicles are going to be end all for our environment problems and all this other stuff that we're having with gas. <laughs> and they said, it's not going to happen because first you got to create the batteries, like Fred said, with the materials. They talked about lithium. We're limited in building, getting, finding lithium. It also uses nickel. All of yeah. this stuff to create lithium for the batteries uses coal oh, and it uses oh, gas oh, so a lot of talking coal. about it it's, it's a misnomer that they're going to solve it what's it going to do it's going to make it worse according to this article yeah but i don't know it, it, yeah. you know you're damned if you don't and damned if you don't so who knows well you know like my father always said the number one cause of death is birth <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just had to throw that in there um Hey, who knows? Um, you know, th this is this is more of a of a conversation about what might happen, but it might not. Okay. Anyway, can we move on, or do we have other discussion points relative to that? Can I add something? Sure. Go ahead. If my memory is correct. I think right now China is our only supply of rare earth minerals, and the only place in the U.S. I don't know if it was Nevada or in Montana that can mine for that, they were prohibited because of environmental concerns. Yes, yes. I, I remember reading that. Yep. So. Air earth mining is going through a boom in Australia at the moment, because where they have, they're intending to compete with China for supplies. Okay. And uh, well, the other thing that's happening in Australia, they're trying to push uh, hydrogen fuel. Okay. So generating it from solar energy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Richard. It's always good to get a perspective from halfway around the world. Yes. It certainly, it certainly emphasizes that this is one of the current trends, just oh, like, just like sure. your discussion about AI and chat yep. GPT. This yep. is what's going on. Right. And it's all evolving. Mm -hmm. And so if you weren't paying attention to it before, and I'm sure 
most of you were, although how many of us were paying attention to matter? Right. Sometimes we learn about things we weren't quite aware of. Right. And maybe that's going to happen in the next section of this talk, too. You never know. You never know. It's kind of, kind of like the way I do things. <laughs> I mean, the, for those of you who are, are, are new to, to these sessions, um, I've probably been giving this talk or a variation of it uh, for at least, because I know I gave it in 1996 when I was actually an AT&T employee back then working on their internet service. Uh, and I probably gave it before then as well. So anyway, I just like doing this. So let's, let's move on and talk about bandwidth Bandwidth, because after all, it's all about bandwidth. Uh, we do have a changing wired, and I use wired in quotes because you'll see why in a minute. Uh, in terms of home internet access, uh, what you're seeing is an increasing use of fiber to the home, all right? Uh, John gave me an example a couple of weeks ago where Optum Altis customers get fiber connected right to their cable modems. Right, John? Yes, straight right. to my living room. Straight to his living room, right? At the same time, you're seeing ads where providers are touting five gigabits per second or more connections. Now, <clears throat> here's where I go back and I say, okay, there may be a couple of you who will say, who needs five gigabits per second? What are you ever going to do with that much bandwidth? I will remind you that I worked with someone in 1982 who said to me at the time, 9.6 kilobits is too fast. And I said to that person, why is it too fast? He said, because the characters on my HP 2621P uh, terminal scroll by too fast. I can't read them. And I said to that person, whatever happened to control S, control Q, if you have that problem? By the way, that person left and went to work for Hayes Moda. Hmm. Go figure. But anyway, if providers are touting five gigabits per second, I am sure that five, 10 years from now, we'll look back and say, hey, remember the, the days when one gigabit was slow for whatever reason? Who knows, all right? And the cable industry is, is paying attention here too because they're working on 10, gigabit, 10 gigabits per second and beyond to customers across the globe. They have this, this uh, standard called DOCSIS and DOCSIS 4.0 uh, goes a long way in helping them do things like this. Also, wired landscape, you've got T-Mobile and Verizon in the United States providing 5G wireless, and we're talking mobile 5G here, 5G wireless home internet access. They will put a box in your house, tell you to put it by a window, and it will connect to their 5G wireless network to provide you with internet access to your home, all right? So that's what's going on in the wired landscape. How about the wireless landscape? Let's look at that. Well, last time we talked about Wi-Fi 6E, and that was the fastest standard that came out in 2019. Uh, Wi-Fi, oh, excuse me, Wi-Fi 6 came out in 2019. Wi-Fi 6E is even better. And what that does is add 1200 megahertz of additional bandwidth in the six gigahertz band. Remember, before Wi-Fi, uh, only use 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. Now they've added 6 gigahertz to the mix. And of course, that's for close range connection between devices in the same room, things like that. Uh, and of course, it's cleaner bandwidth because there are no earlier generation Wi-Fi devices that are in that 6 gigahertz band, unlike 2.4 gigahertz. Now, not to be outdone, Wi-Fi 7 is starting to rear its head. The Wi-Fi Alliance is still working on a standard, but they expect to have ratification of that next year. But that doesn't stop people. Um, this standard is expected to provide a theoretical max throughput 
of at least 46 gigabytes per second. Compare that with Wi-Fi 6, which is at nine, a, a paltry 9.6, and Wi-Fi 5, also known as 802.11ac, that's even less paltry at 3.5 gigabits per second. Uh, MediaTek has been helping develop the standard, and they claim to have some devices that are expected to become available this year. And TP-Link also talks about Wi-Fi 7. If you go to that link, you will see they've got a big page here about Wi-Fi like never before, touting all of its benefits, things like that. And if you look way down here, there's, there's the table I took the years from, uh, how it works, blah, blah, blah. And down here, you'll see that uh, they've got some products coming soon that are um, wireless mesh routers, some Wi-Fi routers, and some access points. So um, people are definitely paying attention to this Wi-Fi 7 thing. Also, let's take a look at what 5G coverage is around the world. This is the map that I showed you in 2021. You'll notice here that in the North Pacific, uh, there's a two here, a 48 here, and down here in New Zealand, there's a 15 in 2021. Compare that with 2022, where this jumps to 202, that jumps to 20. If you look at February 2023, this jumps to 216, that's now 26. Uh, Melbourne has got 3.7K. There are boatloaded in uh, Australia, too. So 5G coverage is getting more and more prevalent around the world. Um, and, and of course, keep in mind, there's two flavors of 5G. There's the what I call a longer range 5G, which uses the lower frequencies be below six gigahertz and the upper frequencies in the uh, 28 to 39 gigahertz range. And if you watch the Super Bowl, you um, I read an article where Verizon provided um, uh, the high band capability inside the stadium so that people could both watch the game and stream whatever they wanted on their, uh, on their um, smartphones at the same time because of this increased bandwidth that is provided by this uh, 5G system. Oh, another thing that happened last year, 3G went away to make room for 5G frequencies. So all your major US cellular carriers sunsetted or got rid of 2G and 3G networks. Uh, the earliest one was AT&T, the latest one was Verizon, and it's gone. And what that means is uh, there were dozens of vehicle models released between 2010 and 2021 that lost the ability to update location traffic data while navigating, and others couldn't connect to their uh, smartphone voice assistants, what have you. And of course, here we're talking about older smartphones like iPhone 5s and Samsung uh, earlier models, 3s and 4s, and older tablets and e-readers. Things like that. So any questions on bandwidth? You know, something, uh, I have uh, both uh, Verizon and Optimum, 300 megabytes per second internet connection. The Verizon is fiber, the Optimum is cable. The uh, Fios connection is like five times faster, even though they're both 300 megabytes a second. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, the interesting thing there is, if you read the fine print, it will say up to 300. And if your optimum is still, is your optimum a coax? Yes. Uh, okay, coax is a shared medium, which means if you have a lot of neighbors who also have that and they're doing it at the same time, they're sharing that bandwidth with you. Whereas with fiber, it's your bandwidth all the way back into the switch itself, okay? So by definition, if it's fiber, you're gonna get um, simultaneous up and down speeds that are pretty much the same and pretty consistent. I mean, John Stanfield tested his fi recent fiber connection and he was able to, you, you're signed up for 300, right, John? Yeah, I have 300 up and 300 down on optimum fiber. And I can usually hit over 275 in the middle of the day. Yep, yep. Both, both directions. 
Right. Now, keep one thing in mind, folks. When you're doing speed tests like that, make sure you're using a newer computer. Because if you're using an older computer on the same connection, yep. you won't get as much. Yes. My, the computer that I'm on right now with you guys is an older computer, and it has an older Wi-Fi connection. Okay? Yep. 802.11 AC or something. Oh, okay. It, even AC. It oh, yeah. Can, okay. It yep. can only get 90 megabits per second. There you go. And a lot of that the new one downstairs, which is an AX11, it gets the 275. Well, so, and I, and I so if also, you, go ahead, John. I was just going to say, if you go and you buy a higher speed internet connection from your ISP and you don't upgrade your computer by either an external connection or something like that, you're wasting your money. You're not going to get that throughput. Right, right. And by the way, folks, this is nothing new. Because I remember when I was working in 1999, remember that century, um, that there, you know, we did the same type of test with older and newer hardware on the same connection. Sure enough, the older hardware got a lower speed than the newer hardware at that time, 23 years ago. So nothing has changed there. Okay. Anything else about bandwidth? BIOS fiber, and I get uh, uh, a good 900 up and down normally. Yep, yep. Yep, you're probably subscribed to their gigabit service. So that's yeah. cool. Yep. Excellent. Well, anyway, folks, this brings me to my last slide, which I've used for many, many years now, and it's all about change. So remember, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things or change. The next statement was made by a guy named Machiavelli. And when did he make it? In 1513, a couple of days ago, right? Since then, nothing endures but chains. Heraclitus said that. And of course, not to be outdone, I put my own spin on it. The only thing that changes is the rate. And thank you again, Fred, for picking up that little tidbit. That's all, folks. Any other questions? Did you find any trends in computer operating systems or hardware? Um, nothing major that was worth putting in here at this time, um, you know? Um, I, guess, I guess the demise of Windows 10 and earlier will have a big effect on some people by 2025. Yeah, yeah that could be, yep, yep. And hey, the, I mean, the continued introduction of Linux distributions uh, that are tailored to people who are coming off the Windows bandwagon um, you know, that, that's been there for a while, but that's getting better and better. I mean, you've seen uh, distributions now that uh, cater to people who do games and, and, and uh, all kinds of things. Andy, do you were trying to say something? Yeah, I just had a question for you. Uh, again, always a nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, you. You talked about the Matter Protocol and bandwidth and electric vehicles more connectivity, more sharing, uh, quicker, better, faster, yep. yada, yada. Right. Um, and again, still the lack of standards, you know, they're getting to the point of where they're trying to adopt more standards. My question is with the connectivity and the connectivity yep. and, and the bandwidth, mm -hmm. are there any, how much of are they addressing the security aspects with data breaches in the news on a daily or weekly basis and cybersecurity being a, a big corporate concern, the yeah. more data, you know, nobody reads their, you know, everybody just clicks on the okie dokie for the 30 or 40 page terms of service agreement. 
Yep. So once you connect to something, they own you, basically. Yep. Um, I'm just curious if you know if there was anything more about. I I know in the current news they're talking about uh, again after the fact with this section 230 and. Yeah. Well, that's you know, yeah, that's that prime. That's just liability. That's not. That, that's correct. Section two thirty is liability, right? Any comments on the security aspects? No, uh, but you keep talking about it. Why don't you prepare a presentation on it, Andy? I have questions. I don't have any answers. I don't well, deal with it on a regular basis. You know, when, when you try to prepare a presentation, you try to get to see if there's any answers out there, and there may not be. No, but that's okay. Uh, but no, I haven't, you know, I didn't run across any, you know, I, well, the way I, I choose these topics is <clears throat> what topic, um, uh, how many emails or, or news articles come across my eyeballs per day on a given uh, topic? And that's pretty much how I chose what I talk about. So that's my algorithm, if you will. Did you get it from AI? Did I get it? From, well, the AI thing has been, you know, that's all over the place. No, your algorithm. <laughs> oh, did I get it from? No, I didn't get it from AI. No, I got it from my own, my own little pea brain. Let, let me let me probe this AI, this chat uh, yeah. GPT AI, just a little bit more. I'm sure, really, why not? Really grappling with it. I mean, it, it's in the news, you know, obviously. Yep. And it's presented as a nefarious uh, means of communicating. And I grew up playing animals and Dr. Eliza. Okay. Uh, animals, you simulate um, a guessing game where you, you either play against the computer or the computer plays against you. You try to guess the animal by asking discriminating questions. It can narrow it down to either answer your uh, your your uh, uh, animal, find out what your animal is, and, and if it does and it didn't know it, it can add it to the database inventory, which is kind of cool. You know, it, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're demonstrating some added information that's going into the, uh, into the database. I also see AI and machine learning and what they call deep learning, neural networks, and all these terms all wrapped into one as being great tools to uh, predict uh, weather, maybe disasters, maybe earthquakes, maybe a little bit more sensitive to earthquakes, um, to do medical diagnosis, to do medical treatments. Yep. But bringing it back to such an elementary level of chat, is it just to tease us, to get us wet for another TikTok, another Twitter, another Instagram, which I bet very few of us are involved in that. I mean, you asked the question eight years ago, how many of us owned a tablet? Right. How, how many knew what a tablet was? Right. And yep. I, think, I think you've got a very, very low response. And this is eight years ago. Now, now we're talking about uh, a chat, which is, uh, you know, they're already doing chat. You know, why do we need another chat? Well, well the, the, this is based on natural language and and lots of, of stuff. By the way, the one thing I didn't mention, which is in the notes on, on the presentation, is that uh, I'm trying to remember who it is. is it CNN? Someone is starting to think about maybe uh, um, looking with a scans at this because they're using copyrighted material as their corpus <laughs> of knowledge. Okay, and who knows what what legal ramifications that might have. Uh was it Fred who already brought that up in one no. of the discussion forums? It no, was I, mentioned I, in our members' discussion forums. I didn't, I, didn't bring up any, I didn't bring up anything about copyright. I think somebody else may have. Yeah. But there, there, there's a book I have on infinity. And it okay. says if you have uh, every atom uh, and, and you had uh, uh, infinite number of typewriters. Right. And they, they spit out you know, yeah. documents, it, it would be like 1% of all the information 
uh, that humankind has ever created right from from day day one when humans started to communicate so you know you're bound to hit something i mean you're you know nothing, yep. nothing is original i mean it's got to have some basis on something that preceded it nothing yep. is original so I, I didn't say anything about copyright john yeah we, we all we all copy we all copy yeah you, know. uh, you, you mentioned but, eliza the program eliza yeah e-l-i-z-a yeah, e yeah. I yeah. took I took my first computer course from Professor Weizenbaum at MIT back when he was developing that program. I got a D in that course, and now I ended up in computers. <laughs> but anyway, that the thing is that in 1964-66, they were developing a computer program to interact with human beings and try to uh, convince you that you were talking to another human being just on the basis of doing pattern matching of okay. what you typed in because they there was no language interaction you had to type it in this was right. still before there were windows and graphical user interfaces right this is all not new. so from 1960 call it 65 that's 35 58 50 almost 60 years ago people have been working on this. So to see what the trends are, if you had given this presentation in 1965, you would have said, oh, next year, we're gonna have a computer that can interact with human beings like that. Well, so next year, we're gonna have all electric cars. Next year, the thing that we know is absolutely happening is higher bandwidth. Yes. Since I started working at AT&T in 1972, once you put the fiber in the ground, once you put the yeah. medium in the ground, all they kept doing was changing the equipment on the ends yeah. to increase the capacity. Because the expensive part was putting the wire in the ground yeah. or building the microwave tower. Then they just changed the stuff on the end and kept increasing how much they could send through it. So adding bandwidth is an interesting thing. That will happen faster yeah. than yeah. all of the other things. Yeah. Everybody else is trying to make a nickel on you or a quarter or a dollar, right? Nowadays, inflation. So all of these things are being driven by people trying to have jobs, trying to make money, trying to earn a living. Some people actually do things for art, for the love of it. We play with computers. Some of us are in the business with computers here. And we used to have lots of people who were learning from the club because they needed it for their job. Right. Now you put in artificial intelligence, and all you have to do is touch the screen or something like that. So we're playing with these things. What Bill Silverman brought up at the last graphics meeting, photogrammetry. I don't think that most, I say this, my wife always criticizing me for talking about most people. You can't see the software changes, but in the last five years, Photogrammetry has taken immense changes and it's affecting all kinds of things, including architecture, using LIDAR to discover that there were huge cities and numbers of people in the Amazon. And they all died off when the Europeans came to the, uh, to the new world. But the LIDAR is being used to find the evidence of those places and in all the other places too. So, uh, and it using faster computers and better programming. The programming is advancing immensely. And what are the trends there? Well, Sujit showed us how he could use Copilot to have it write code for him in last month's general meeting. It's like, whoa, that's, that's really something. All kinds of changes are happening 
underneath what Bill talked about to enable all of these things that are still going to take 50 or 60 years before they work in a way that we aren't just complaining about them and being fearful of them. Yeah. It'll, it'll just be part of our lives. Yeah. Another great presentation and uh, stay awake. Don't avoid the news. Worry about what, you know, all of these things are now able to create fake news. Yeah. But you can do simple things with chat GPT. I used it to create a list of prompts for my wife to be able to paint every morning. Ask it simple questions that can give you useful results, not just things that you could have asked Siri for. Anyway. I have a question on electric vehicles again. Yeah. Uh, a regular conventional electric vehicle supposedly gets 250 to 400 miles of charge. We yep. have a hybrid that can go either gasoline or electric. Supposedly, they only get like 40 miles on a charge. Does anyone know what the real well, truth is on that? <clears throat> As a hybrid owner for the last, let's see, what year is this, 23? Uh, for the last 17 years, I've been driving a hybrid, okay? And um, the way the hybrid works is it uses both the battery and the internal combustion engine as needed to provide power, right? And uh, when you put your foot on the brake, it's going to do uh, use the eddy effect. Uh, to regenerate electricity and pump it back into the battery. So what was your question again about? Suppose well, you ran out of gas, how far could you really get on a hybrid battery? Well, okay, if it is a, um, a, a plain vanilla hybrid, um, you might get, I don't know, half a mile, something like that. But with plug-in hybrids that have bigger batteries, they're intended to go 10, 20, 30, 40 miles on battery alone. So the idea with those is you drive them short distances, you're using pure battery, you come home, you plug it in, and you fill it up again. I remember, um, oh, this has been several years ago now, I was at a, a BCG meeting, I came out and the gentleman had a, a Chevy Volt, okay? I got in to drive it and I looked and it said, uh, uh, miles per gallon was 192. And I said, how's that possible? He said, because most of the time I drive at short distances, it uses electric only, and I plug it in. So I keep it charged up. So the amount of gas that it uses is not a whole lot, right? So if you have a plug-in hybrid, you're, and you keep it charged, you're bound to get much, much higher gasoline mileage. And with a plug-in hybrid, the way those work is, if your bat battery drains down to a certain point, it becomes a regular hybrid, where it then uses the engine to um, charge the battery and work with the engine, depending upon which type of hybrid it is. Uh, they work together, as in a Toyota, or um, others, the um, internal combustion engine just charges the battery to drive the electric motor only, okay? Does that answer your question? Yeah, th thank you. Okay. Anybody else? How did they come up with this name matter? I mean, that's a protocol. That's like, that's like D metaverse, metaverse. D-I-I-K. What do they do? Picking these names out of the, out of the air? I have no idea, Fred. None. Somebody said it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, right. Okay. So they said, yes, it does. It, it's matter. Sure, it's matter. Come on. What's wrong? What's wrong? It's an old Buddy Holly song. I'm sure there is. It doesn't matter anymore. Okay. Yeah. I'm, sure there was a, I'm sure there was a focus group involved somewhere along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, yeah. Well, the fact that they got all of those corporations and people to work together oh. on a common standard so that they I mean, that was one of the things that was hobbling the Internet of Things evolution. Uh, and they saw that it was 
happening and that they could stick computers into everything, the little computers being so cheap and could report back and sell you a new yep. filter for your refrigerator, right? Yep. Oh, you know, just put it on the internet. It, it reminds me of, I gave a talk one time in 1994 in Moscow, all right, on networks of the future. And one of the questions I got asked was, so Bill, how can you have competition and cooperation at the same time, okay? Remember, this was Moscow in 1994, five years after the wall came down. So I thought about it and I said, remember that their ideology has been different for the last 70 years. So I said, remember the pie chart I showed you that showed the industry growing? It's the cooperation of the members of the industry that make it grow. At the same time, each member has their own unique product or service. It creates differentiation and those two things exist and competition, those two things exist at the same time. I think we're seeing the same type of thing happen with matter. They realize they have to work together to grow the industry, right? Some things never change. And they're all driven by capitalism. Absolutely. You got it. And so in Moscow, somebody asking that question, yeah. might not have understood at that time how oh. that was possible. Oh, absolutely. I, I fully realize that. And that's why I said to myself, be very careful how you answer this question because their ideology has been different. And I made that answer up on the spot and they accepted it. Boy, oh boy. But that's what I think we're seeing here with matter. That's the big bucks, Bill. <laughs> yeah, it's here for big bucks, man. <laughs> okay, I I guess that is, uh, you stopped sharing? Yeah, I did. Th thank you, everyone. We had a good turnout. I In the process of expanding our openness and uh, searching for new members and participation from people of all ages. Uh, other workshops have experienced interruptions and what we call trolls. And we may not, we tried not to uh, get rid of them too quickly. I apologize, but this is also one of the things that happens, one of the trends in technology. Someone asked, you asked, asked Andy about security. There will be more breaches. There will be more opportunities. There will be more people who will use their intelligence for nefarious purposes. And hopefully the people in this club will share how to protect themselves and, uh, and contribute and protect the world. And I hope that you will look at the schedule and attend other meetings. I'll remind you that members who Everybody, every member has access to groups.io BCUG. You can read the messages in all of the subgroups, even if you are not a member, subscribe to those subgroups so that you do not get the announcements. You can read them anyway, because you're a member of the overarching BCUG group. And if you want announcements being sent to you, of when the meetings are with their Zoom access information, then you can subscribe to those subgroups. If you want to comment in those subgroups, you should subscribe to the subgroup and you can adjust the frequency with which you get emails. You can get them one a day, immediately, one a week. If you get them one a week, you might get the announcement of the meeting after it's happened. So. We look forward to your further participation and we look forward to hearing from you about what you would like to see the club do in the future. It was great seeing you all. Okay, have a good one, folks. Yeah. Uh